Okay, asante uh, sana. Yes, today is a very, very interesting uh, meeting where we having uh, uh, where we having the Rotary and Rotary family that is under the Rotary Club of Nairobi just coming together and uh, sharing uh, knowledge and ideas around leadership and business uh, led by uh, a very phenomenal speaker that is Julie Bishuru. And before we get to her, I'll pick around two, three people to just share what they understand on the topic and also what are the expectations for today's meeting. And I will start us off with the host president, that is Rotarian Ritesh. Thank you, thank you, President Ambrose. Sorry, I lost connectivity for a moment. Could you kindly repeat? Uh, yes, you, you're just sharing uh, what you're looking forward to for the meeting. Well, this is, uh, thank you, President Ambrose. I'm, I'm particularly glad that uh, the Rotaract clubs have uh, come together for this wonderful program this Saturday evening. And um, congratulations on the great work you're doing uh, as Rotaract clubs. And I'm looking forward to the talk by Julie Gishuru, as uh, I'm aware uh, that a lot of us have logged in. You've got a wonderful guest speaker today. So we look forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, President Ritesh. I'll now pick uh, an attendee by the name Nyambura, Nyambura Sal. You can please share with us what you're looking forward to learn from the meeting. Thank you. Well, I look forward to hearing more about leadership, uh, more so because it's become a very uh, civil time. Term. So I hope Judy is going to demystify and help the Rotaractors to have a clear idea of uh, what leadership should be in the contemporary world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nyambura. And also, finally, within our Mideast, there's a very huge fan of uh, Yuli. If you look at his profile picture, you like if you look at his picture, you'll actually realize it's one uh, that he was lucky enough to take with Julie. And I'm sure he's looking forward to the meeting. So, Mr. Cornell, please tell us what are you what you're looking forward to for today's meeting. Hear me, if you can hear me, please. Okay, in the absence of Hemi, I'll pick uh, Linda, Linda Bugo. You can share with us what you're looking forward to learn from today's meeting. And then after Linda, we'll have uh, Eunice, that is the president of the Rotaract, Rotaract Club of KCA, introduce the, the speaker for today, and then we'll proceed to the program. So, Linda. Hi, everyone. Um, looking forward to learning about gaining more uh, leadership skills, uh, professional networking purposes. Julie has been one of the main people that we've seen how she's moved into business, and I'd like to learn more about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Linda. I think uh, with uh, having set on, having heard from a few of us on what we're expecting, I think we can proceed directly to have the speaker. So Eunice, you may please introduce Julie. Yes, Eunice, please. Okay. 
Okay, I think we are not in a position to hear you. Uh, Rotaria Nicodemans, are you able to take up <laughs> the child? Yes, Eunice. If you can hear us, please unmute yourself and proceed with the introduction. Yes, Thank you. you. Sorry. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can, we can hear, hear you now. Sorry, I had an issue with the network. I can go ahead. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest and speaker for today, Julie Gishuru. Uh, our speaker, she is very passionate and uh, the head of public affairs and communications. Our guest has a long list of great achievements which will probably, probably work these out from her long list of remarkable achievements, which I will now try to attempt to expound on. Julie is a communication specialist with a 20 year career in the fields of broadcast, print and digital media. Her profile in Kenya grew as she pioneered investigative television and programming on political and current affairs. She conceptualized and launched numerous top shows and developed the Pan-African television show, African Leadership Dialogues. Following the 2007 elections, Julie's peace specials resonated with viewers. As a result of her calls for nonviolent action in 2008, she was awarded the Martin Luther King Salute of Greatness. Following this pivotal period, determined to contribute towards a more informed and responsible generation, Julie established the Great Debaters Contest, a high school debate platform focused on teaching students that differences need not result in conflict and violence. Her career focus shifted to curating impactful engagement and driving conversation focused on African leadership, growth and development. Over the past decade, Julie has worked very closely with partners like the World Bank, the IFC, the African Development Bank, various UN agencies, Wongozi Institute, and the World Economic Forum. As an advocate for positive change, Julie established her own production house, Arima's Media Limited, focused on editorial production and digital content, training and igniting possibilities through collaborative programs and in initiatives. She sits on several boards and is part of a number of fellowships, including the Tutu Fellowship, the Aspen Global Leadership Network, Africa Leadership Initiative, and the Young Global Leaders under the World Economic Forum. Julie has received numerous awards and commissions. Most recently, Avance Media listed her as one of the 100 most influential African women of 2019. A new African listed her as one of the 100 most influential Africans of 2019. Sorry. Julie was born in Nairobi, Kenya. She attended university in the United Kingdom, where she learned her LLB law and MBA from Cardiff University's law and business schools, respectively. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker for today, Julie Gishuru. Karibu sana. Asante, asante sana. And it's always such a pleasure to come and speak to the Rotary and to Rotarians. And, and it's an honor. It's, it's an honor for me. So thank you for having me. I realize our time is really short. So what I plan to do is give you a 10 minute overview on business and leadership and my thoughts. And then I really would love to take your thoughts and comments and maybe respond to them if that's okay. Um, if you see me get distracted for a minute and just you know wave at someone or jump, my husband has just arrived. He had been away, so please excuse me. I'll, I'll get a little distracted. So, um, Great to be with you all. Can I ask us all just to mute so we can all hear and unmute when, when it's time for the Q&A or put your comments and questions in the chat. 
let me start by saying, first of all, thank you so much, Eunice, for reading my profile. Um, I, in December, made a huge sidestep in my career and accepted a position at the MasterCard Foundation, heading the global public affairs and communications docket. So right now, I'm, I'm, I'm an employee again. I actually handed over the reins of my business and stepped away completely. Um, so I come to you in a different vein. And maybe let me explain the why, because I had a lot of flexibility. My business was doing well. When I stepped out of Citizen, I thought I was going to go into a business where we would do a lot of entertainment, current affairs content. But I found that's not where the demand was. The demand was driving really purposeful conversations around development. And so I ended up becoming a communication specialist in, in, in development. And when we say development, what does that mean? It simply refers to how we better the lives of our communities, of each of us. That's what my view of development is. And um, last year, I did a bit of work with the MasterCard Foundation and a very, very good consultancy. I mean, I could have stayed on the consultancy. I didn't need to, to take a job. But they said to me, look, Julie, um, we want you to come in. We have a vision to get 30 million young Africans in dignified work by 2030. And we realize we have to do it with Africa has to do this. We're not going to do this. And we need African minds to help us craft the way forward. And the agenda seemed just so much biz bigger than any business I could do. This opportunity to make a difference. So I accepted a job. So I'm, I, I'm starting there just to put it, it in context. Now let me come to business as I understand it. Then I'm going to touch on what I think leadership is or what my life has taught me leadership is. And then I want to hear your questions and your comments. And I'm going to finalize by saying, by asking you guys a question, if that's okay. Um, so let's talk about business and let's talk. Okay. Hubby is here. Guys, let me hug him. Give me 10 seconds to give him a hug and then I'll be back. Just give me 10 seconds. Thank you. Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, business. So I want to say a couple of things about business with a lens on the world we live in right now. A world where um, everything has shifted. A world where people are now starting to understand COVID is not just going to end. We are living with COVID somehow. It's a, it's a longer term game. And what does it mean for Africa? And, and that's my main focus. And what does it mean for the majority of young people, I believe on this call, the Rotaractors? And where are your challenges and your opportunities? Business to me is very simple. It's leveraging opportunity to make something sustainable and ultimately to make a profit is what many people seek to do. Um, but it's also, I think, should be giving back, right? It should be what you contribute and produce in a community, in an economy. And if it has value to that economy, they consume it and they pay for it. And then it is super successful. In this current era of COVID, we're facing a lot of challenges. But the greatest opportunity I see is in the broken supply chains that really were dominated uh, by colonial patterns and trends. And now we have an opportunity to start asking in Africa, where do we get ABC, right? It's easier to source it within. So this I think is the biggest opportunity we have. The challenge we have with COVID is to understand it and to learn how to adapt to survive and thrive in a COVID environment. But Africa has faced Ebola. Africa has faced other challenges and we have proven we learn fast. We're agile, we shift. And although we politicize things a lot, the rest of the world seems to politicize things a lot more. So, you know, hopefully we will be agile and be able to figure out how to survive in this COVID era. 
if we figure out what must we do from a business perspective at a personal level if you are a young person thinking about running a business you've got to ask yourself what are your skills learn skills and talent as well what are they where are your strengths and where are your competencies what do you know you've got to know what you don't know and if you need those skills within your business you've got to look for those skills don't assume don't assume go for the best and the best doesn't mean a lot of money it could be another young person but give them a fair shake and a fair opportunity and get them in um what's the demand where's the gap where's the gap ultimately the businesses that will thrive are the ones that meet a need in our communities and the needs now are getting more and more basic right what is the need identify the need identify your ability your interest in the, your skills and ability to fill the gap pull together the competencies you need and try just try let me also say there are numerous businesses you may try that will fail if you are a true entrepreneur you have the resilience to keep trying i think it was bruce lee who said you know i don't fear the man you know who 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 you know um does one kick really well i fear the man who's practiced a kick you know a thousand times that's the one who's got it right michael jordan said the same thing he said he had he failed so many times so many times but it's the fact that he kept trying and he perfected the art of basketball that made him win muhammad ali said the same thing eliud kipchoge if you follow him you watch him getting up every day and he's running again and he's running again that is the spirit of entrepreneurship it is resilience it is keep going it is learn adapt shift do what you need to do and 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 move forward um final thing i'm going to say about business i'm keeping this really simple because i think we have to get back to simplicity it is not big business that matters every big business started somewhere and when we have belief and understanding that we can do the simple things then we start to the journey and we succeed this is a big one for me this last one i want to mention around business which is networks and the young people on this continent fastest growing population fastest growing in the world right young people in africa this demographic is booming that means you are the biggest market why all of a sudden do you think you know 8 8 to 9 10 years google said hey actually we need to be in africa and all these other big global digital players who never paid attention to africa are running to africa because everybody's realizing this is where facebook is here now Every, everybody's coming they're coming in hard cuz this is the biggest growing market in the world that's what you guys are and so let me ask this if young people on this continent decide to support each other number 1 to ask brands that are already established and large what are you doing with young people do you have them in your supply chains are you supporting them in one way or another are you doing some training capacity building are you engaging if you're not you're not brands we want to work with if you are we're with your brand you get a young young africans thumbs up if you support young africans right but more than that hold each other's hands. So I'm just going to give a simple example. Since the shutdown, you know, I used to we used to shop so easily and I would actually shop mainly when I travel because I don't like shopping and you need things so at the airports I pick things up. Now I'm shopping from home. And now I am buying all African made products. So shea butter for my body and my hair. you know aloe vera again for my hair and my body i'm looking for shampoos and conditioners made in africa i'm looking for coffees done in kenya in other countries i found a wonderful chocolate maker chocolate maker in kenya making better chocolate than i've ever ever had in switzerland and so everything is here who are you buying from guys i want you to think about that are you making really informed decisions about what you buy even soap even so i'm not buying store you know mass produced soap anymore i'm actually buying the bars that a young lady is is curating with love with 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 green tea and 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 vanilla and with you know 
and 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 that makes her viable but you're waiting for business are you supporting other young businesses right and african businesses uh, i'll stop there on business and i really want to hear your questions and comments i'll go to leadership now what is leadership what is leadership leadership is the personal responsibility one takes to step up and to stretch themselves in service of others so I don't think it's leadership if you're doing it for yourself or if you're on your own and doing incredible things. Really, there's got to be others in leadership. And it's got to be in service of, not self, but the others to be true leadership, good leadership anyway, right? The ability to mentor and to guide, not just control and supervise. So we've been in an era where Control, supervision, management has been a big leadership thing, right? But now, ever since I joined the foundation, our president and CEO, Rita Roy, and all the senior team, so incredibly, incredibly giving of themselves. Leadership is a willingness to say, I'll make time for you. You may, you know, I'm here. Let's, let's put our heads together. But I also want to tell you, I'm here to guide and mentor you. But guys, I don't know everything. In fact, actually... I need to learn. I need to listen. Let's talk. You'll teach me. I'll teach you. And whatever it is I can give of you, I will give. You know, the final thing I want to say about leadership, leadership must be kindness. It must embody kindness. And we've lived in a world that never associated the word kind, kindness, respect, humility, grace with leadership. But never, more than ever before, do we, need, do we need that now. We need to be kind to each other. We need to be kind to our families. We need to be kind to our, our spouses and our children and our parents. And we need to be kind to the people that we work with. And we need to be kind, especially to the people that maybe work within our departments and that we have supervisory roles over. And in being kind to them, they understand and they they embody and emit that same spirit. And then you start to build an organization or a community that is completely different, completely different. Um, I want to stop there and I, I would love to hear your thoughts and comments. It's maybe a bit of a different, maybe you were expecting to hear more about finance and access to loans and all those things are important. But guys, these are the basics that we don't often talk about. And I really wanted to center this on them. And I'm always happy to come back and bring even more expert people to talk to you guys on some of the other key areas. Um, and I'm happy to talk about marketing and communications, et cetera. Uh, but let me stop there and see what you're thinking and, and, and what your questions are. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Julie. <laughs> uh, I think I will we'll jump to the next phase of just having a discussion, as Julia said. And to start us off, I can see it's uh, Mike Eldon. So Mike, you can please proceed. If you have a question or uh, you have a comment, please just uh, put it in the, on the chat box. I'll be able to pick you up. Mike, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ambrose and Julie. So good to be hearing you with your usual vibrance and enthusiasm. I loved what you said about um, having people understand what their skills and their talents and their abilities, their competencies are. You know, when I joined the Rotary Club of Nairobi in 1978, the first job that was given to me was careers guidance. And what I focused on when I started running workshops for University of Nairobi students was self-exploration because my strong sense then and over 40 years later now is that this is so lacking. People have not been um, mentored, guided, to use your two words, into self-exploration to understand who they are and what they're offering to the world and linking that up with what the world is looking for. And it goes along with a sense of excess humility 
that prevents them being straightforward by acknowledging those strengths and those talents, which also leads them to write much weaker CVs than they should. So I just wanted to reinforce that and for the rotor actors present to say that um, this is something I, I've done a lot of work with over the years, not that recently with rotor actors, but with others. But you know, when I was chairman, president of our Rotaract club in the mid eighties, I relaunched the Rotaract club of Nairobi Central. And um, now with Anuja's great follow up to actualization, I initiated um, the work to begin a Rotaract club at KCA University. So I, I would urge Rotaractors to find ways of getting mentors and guides like Julie and others to help you identify your uh, strengths um, and based on the achievements that you shouldn't underrate. I want to come to my question to you now, Julie. I'm doing a lot of work with the National Cohesion and Integration Commission on uh, social cohesion uh, in the time of COVID and on um, ensuring a peaceful build-up to the 2022 election. And a lot of the work that NCIC is trying to do is to focus, as I do in much of my life, on nurturing the national ethos and national values, which is so difficult to get people to think about usefully, constructively, um, the values in the Constitution, 17 of them, whatever, buried deep there, no one ever refers to them, no one knows what they are, and no one brings them to life. Other countries have done such a good job on having a few punchy uh, phrases to personify the national values. How do you look at national values? What advice would you give to the National Cohesion and Integration Commission in building Kenya up towards a peaceful election in 2022 beyond the current um, political nonsense over BBI and all the rest of it? Thanks, thanks for that, Michael. And uh, Mike, well done on everything. You know, when you take us through your journey, it's just so remarkable. And it would be great to learn more about, you know, what you got on career guidance and, and, and what works, what doesn't work. A lot of work needs to go into, I think, empowering young people to really stand in their skills and, and to blow their trumpets, you know, to get the roles um, they, they really deserve. Um, national values. I wonder if I was to ask us all, what do you think the number one national value in Kenya is? What do you feel? Not think, not think, and, and don't look at other people. What do you feel? What do you feel is a value? And, and you know, it could be positive, could be negative. Just put it in the chat. I'd love to just, and I'm sure it'll be helpful to drive Mike's thinking as well. Just put in the chat, if there's a value we have as Kenyans, that is front and center, what is that value? Would you, would you just share that in the chat? One word, you know, that's personal to you. Mike, you know, my honest sense, and by the way, you know, we've been on this journey for so long. I, I, I've kind of stepped out of it. I, I have a different role now, which is more of an Africa, you know, global, but you know, knowing the journey Kenya has been on and many African countries are on, let me say this, it starts in the family. It really does. And it doesn't matter what we start selling down the line. If in our families we have a different approach, all we are doing is feeding um, confusion. We're not consistent. The education system remains a very, very important player, but we don't want to indoctrinate people. We want them to breathe, live those values. So it's got to start in the family, going to our churches and mosques. It's got to then be part of the education, education system. And I want to just finish by saying that I actually think the majority of Kenyans have very strong value systems. When I walk this country, I feel a warmth in people's hearts. We are incredible people. We just have bad, bad politics that pulls us down every time. And so 
how do we build the positive role models who reinforce the values we need? And so it's your Eliud Kipchoge, it's your brother Peter Tabichi, it's, and we have so many of them, right? Um, so I think those are some of the things, uh, Mike, and, and the detail is tougher. You know, how you go into the families, how and mothers have a key role, fathers even, you know, uh, increased parenting from the father is so important both for him and his family. And, and, and so, yeah, it's hard work. Let me just stop there. It's hard work, but I'm available, Mike, to, to brainstorm when you want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. There's a follow-up question from uh, from Lisa. Lisa is asking, uh, how do you get to balance family and leadership? And then uh, I think we can also join that question with uh, another one from Linda Mpugwa. Linda Mpugwa, if you can hear me, please, you can uh, shoot your question so that uh, Julie can address the two. Tago. Hi, Julie. Great presentation. Um, my question, or rather, uh, I would like to, we currently, the atmosphere is all about entrepreneurship and most of the mentors are telling us to do entrepreneurship. To a point that for those that would prefer to first pursue maybe employment as a, in career, it becomes more of, it's as if it's, it's shameful to a point, so what can you say about that? Because not everyone is made for entrepreneurship. Yeah, not every, I, absolutely right. But can I ask what, I missed a little bit, what did you say feels sometimes shameful? To say that you would prefer employment to entrepreneurship. Okay, okay, I get it. It's so on vogue that you're kind of pushed into that. Um, I, I hear you, I hear you. Um, look, if you can get employment, there's nobody who's gonna scorn you. And by the way, Linda, if they do, that's fine. It's your path, it's your life, you only have one. It, it doesn't matter what anybody says. Figure your path out. If your preference is the, the, the safety net and the, and the you know, of, 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 of employment and, and, and it is safer than entrepreneurship. You know, it's, it's hard, business is hard and not everyone is built for that and that's, and that's okay. And even those built for employment have great skills, competencies, they're heroes too, right? So if that's your path, walk it unapologetically. And if you get something great, look, walk that path, you know, build your career, absolutely. Don't, don't everybody on here, you were born with individual gifts they are yours. If your name is Linda, they are Linda's gifts. It's, if it's Eunice, they're your gifts, Eunice. You know, um, Elvis, they're yours. They were given to you. And your path is different from everybody else's. And I think for me, what was always so important is I listened to myself and I, I mapped my path. I made my mistakes. I learned from them. I shifted where I needed to, but have the confidence to hear your inner voice and give yourself the time and the silence. And silence is not just a sound issue. It's also a state of mind issue to listen to yourself, right? Then it doesn't matter what anybody says. You could think one thing and end up in another, by the way. That's another thing you have to accept is, is the world. Agility is a good skill to have. Um, but I think the most important thing is don't live for others expectations. That's always going to lead to a disappointing life. Always. Yeah. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. On the, on the balancing family, um, question, I think especially for women, and I'm not sure if it's different for men, maybe not. I, I, you know, for me, I've always been very clear. I would rather struggle harder, but be, be in a place where I'm comfortable with the balance I have with my family. I have no doubt that my family takes priority. So when I was having children in the media and going into work at 8.30 a.m., 
And then at 4.30, I would request to be allowed to go and breastfeed for two hours and then come back to read news and leave at 10.30. And a female boss of mine said, no, you can't. So she expected me to work from 8.30 a.m. till 10.30 at night without seeing my children. Um, I said, it's okay, do what you have to do. And I went to I went to feed my children. I breastfed my children right through till some of them were way over two years old, but I wasn't going to take that away from them. I'm a mother first and I will leave jobs. Sometimes jobs will leave you. Um, you know, you never know what will happen in life, but your responsibility to your spouse and to your children cuts above. It's way above anything else. So I think, first of all, that's my clarity is what are my priorities? So I think you've got to know what's important to you and what, what, what takes center stage. When you know that, you've got to show your family that they take center stage. So my husband had to know, I would drop everything for you. Everything in a heartbeat. There is no competition. And the minute he understood that, he became my greatest cheerleader. He became my greatest supporter. He's the one that said, honey, you've got a conference, go do your best. I've got it. The kids are fine. And he'd call me in the morning, I'll speak to the kids before they go to school. They call me in the evening. I speak to them again. And I know my home is okay. To, I'm going to get home soon, but they're okay. And that allows you to do your work. But he, you know, he could do that because he felt loved. And he didn't need to have a question in his mind at any point as to what my priority was. And so that helped that has helped my kids before now actually we're working from home as a foundation for quite a while so i've been at home primarily this year but before that i would negotiate with my youngest i would show him my calendar for the next two months and he was like nine years old and we'd sit and he'd say okay this is where you're going what's that about when do you get back? Okay, so you're away for four days. All right, then how long are you saying? Mom, this one is really long. We need you to be on the ground for a few days. So we would negotiate my schedule. <laughs> and so he knew, Mom, I have a say, you know, and it matters to Mom what I think, you know. So the others were old enough that they didn't really care. They would say, Mom, you're traveling too much. But, you know, they had their own shibulis going on. So, <laughs> um, so it's, it's about it's giving everything you can to the things that are important for me. That's my family and ensuring they know they come first and then it makes it easier. I'm sorry, I know I talk a lot. I hope again that makes sense. Thank you, thank you so much, Julie, for that. I think there's a question from uh, Rotary and Nicodemus and then also from Frederick. And then we have a comment from Rotary and Yusuf. So I think we can have them in that order. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ambrose. Uh, my question to Julie is, uh, okay, uh, I run a small uh, consultancy that I started a couple of years back. And one of the things that hit me hard is uh, navigating the legal infrastructure that we have in Kenya, whereby the pitfalls are so many that uh, you'll be really lucky if you don't fall into at least 10 every year. Yeah? So how to navigate that, that is uh, tax regulations, uh, government registration regulations and all that. And of course, also matters to do with integrity and ethics. There is so much pressure to make so much money so quickly. Really, it, 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 it's really difficult to, to, to look at the long term. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, really, really good questions. I just wonder, you know, I'll come back to, you know, thank you for mentioning navigating the, infra the legal infrastructure as an issue. I'm going to take this back to the foundation. We do a lot of work with partners and, and it's important to know young people in business need places they can go to easily access, uh, possibly, uh, you know, um, uh, a very affordable or 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 free uh, <laughs> legal services. I, I I'll look in, into that. Um, I, let me address the integrity and ethics question in a very simple way. In the short term, breaking rules could be of benefit. In the long term, it can cost you everything. We're living in a world where audits will happen. And everything is interconnected, Nicodemus. So you'd rather be the one. And for the bigger opportunities, people are auditing who they're working with. People are checking out their profiles. People are, you know. So you want to be the ones who come on lists at the top 
because you have built a reputation as an organization of integrity, good governance structures, and how you can help yourself, you know, to, to walk that path is to surround yourself with the right people. Try and get people to join your board who will help navigate the difficult times, who have great networks where you don't have to enter any ethical issues. You, you, can, you can actually introduce yourselves in a way that is, um, it's above board, you're not doing anything wrong, but you get visibility because of a strong, of a strong board, well selected from various different sectors, right? Sometimes you look at the unethical stuff and it's, it's actually dumbfounding just how illogical it is in the long term. Um, and I think you've got to make that, you've got to make the clever decisions, you know, walk the hard journey, but walk the long, the, the long, the long journey that takes you to success. At the end of the day, chicken, if you buy it in Kenchik uh, for 200 bob, tastes the same as the one in Kempinski. Chicken is chicken. I mean, just hold on. There's no urgent need for, you know, for money today. If you sleep on a bed, you sleep on a bed. You know what I mean? Uh, don't get lost in the trappings. And don't, don't. There's no point to it. It is not helpful. Um, surround yourself with excellent people and build strong governance structures in your organization. I think, Nicodemus, that would be hugely helpful for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Julie. Thank you. Thank you for that. We can have Frederick. Okay, uh, thank you, Julie, for that presentation. That is uh, very, very informative. So my question is, uh, uh, for people in leadership positions, uh, most, most, most looking at uh, managerial positions, mostly, when you leave the organizations, but now this is before you leave, is it uh, healthy or advisable, in your opinion, to strategically and uh, objectively nurture some people to take up these roles? Or uh, would it not be considered healthy or it would be looked at as uh, you are biased when you leave? Or we leave it for the natural uh, processes to take place and whoever uh, qualifies for the positions from the natural processes take the position. So is it healthy to strate uh, strategically bring up some people? the sole objective of taking up those roles. Yeah, uh, can, I, can I shift that on its head a little bit? I think you nurture people to take up roles, yes, that's part of it. But the role of any leader, as I said earlier, I have come to learn in my, now starting to become many years on this earth, is, is to be a shepherd. It really is. And, um, and that means, whether it is to take up a position or whether it is, it is actually just because it's the right thing to do, you nurture people. And I'll say this, we, my greatest strength is the competence of my team. My greatest strength are the strong, capable people who sit next to me. And more and more, I am reveling in being able to hand things over and say, you know, take this, run with it. You know, I'm here for advice. This is what I think, but what do you think? How do I support you? What additional training do you need? Let's get it done, let's get it done. You've done the training, excellent. Let's move you to the next level. And if they come and one day push me off my seat, that's success, that's success because I have another place to go, guys. We were not made to be, be, be stationary creatures. I, I, if, if I have not been pushed off my seat in the next few years, there's something wrong with what I've been doing in the organization. I have to move on to my next evolution. That sometimes may not be the office. It could even be the role of the office shifting, right? It could be actually that in the, in the organization, I'm, I'm no longer needed. And the person behind me is competent and I can step out and then let me step to my next thing. It is a sign of lack of self-confidence, self-doubt that we're not able to view things that way. Because if one has belief in themselves 
and, and an understanding of the journey of purpose, you, you are comfortable always with building the rest and then, and then, and then moving on to your next thing or staying, uh, but, but, but being with just a really extraordinary team. So number one, Jack Ma says it best. He says, you know, I was never smart. You know, I didn't get my jobs that I applied for. My teachers told me I was dumb, you know, but I surrounded myself with, I mean, of course he's not, but he's, he's got the humility to, to, to crack these jokes, you know, but um, he said, I surrounded myself with people smarter than me and all the, the, the most brilliant leaders do, do that. Um, and then when you have the smartest people around you, don't hold them down, let them flourish, let them flourish. If you have true confidence in yourself and you know that you have a place no matter where, um, that's something that you can do. Um, I hope it doesn't sound too idealistic. Maybe it sounds very la di da. I don't know, but that that's that's how I think. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Th thank you, Julie, for the response. I think uh, let's have uh, a call from Yusuf before we go on to the final round of questions. And okay. then uh, we can all, yes, Yusuf, go ahead. Yep, I just wanted to share something. You know, I read, uh, first of all, Julie, I think I've always admired you. You have all the attributes of a good leader. Now, I've been thinking, I read in a Rotary magazine once that uh, parents should actually, talking about family and values, that, uh, that, that it should start with the family. Julie, you said that at the very beginning. And they said parents should leave their wills, not just of their financial assets, but also of their values. So my wife and myself had a discussion and we said, you know, if you just give a list of things, the values, it'll just gather dust that you, you have to internalize it. And we decided to have a weekend in Naivasha with all the family, children, grandchildren, there were 10 of us. And we had an external facilitator, a good friend of the families, but of the family, but not someone uh, within the family. And we discussed all the values. And there was my nine-year-old grandson said, I have a big issue with patience. So that's the way the discussion took place. What, what, is all, what are all the values that we feel are important? And then uh, the following day, this discussion came up about nonviolent communication, which is so important. So we spent half the day on nonviolent communication. And what we've done is written all that down, the full, and, and everyone signed off. And what we did was we've got a WhatsApp group to make like case studies, to say that, look, I was tested here. This is how I resolved it. Here I was tested on that but I resolved it. So it's internalized and it's within the family. And that whole method that we chose has been used by other families as well because we've told them how valuable it's been. I just thought I'd share that. Thank you. Can I, can I com com comment on that, Ambrose? I just, I love yes. that. I love that. I think my family is going to to borrow that as well. And let me tell you, Yusuf, your grandson, when he is with his grandchildren, will pass down the values that his grandfather and his parents in that I mean, family gathering and, and the young people discussed, you know, how, how profound, what a thing to do, right? Um, thank you for sharing that. That's really amazing. Um, I, I want to so I just want to touch on, you know, as we're talking about this, Ambrose, I see Jason says here, whenever people say discover yourself, I'm always confused. I know what the word means, but where do you start? What's the first step? So this is the problem with an education system that does not allow young people to find themselves. It puts them into a cookie cutter mold. Each of you go into this cookie cutter mold and you will each be a biscuit of the same shape, right? And you've got a stage on the stage. Your teacher has all the wisdom. Everybody else keeps quiet. If one smart child has a perspective, a response, a debate, you shut them down really quickly and tell them what's on the blackboard is what's supposed to be in your head, you know, which is crazy. So Jason, I just want to encourage you to ask yourself, 
what do you know about yourself today? What do you love? What do you love? Write down five things you know you love. Write down five things you know you hate. I really know I don't like that. Okay. Ask your friends who know you well to describe you in three words and start writing down what they say about you. Ask your parents and your aunties and uncles, people who knew you when you were young, to describe you as a young child in three words. What did you used to do a lot? What did you like doing? What was your personality like? Start a journey of self-discovery through your own eyes, but also through the eyes of those who love you and know you. You'll start to learn things. Then ask yourself, what do you wanna do more of? Where do you wanna go? If you envision yourself at 50, 60, what do you want that to look like? Who do you want to be? And what do you need to do to get there? And that's why I said you need silence. It doesn't mean that it's all quiet, although silence is actually a good thing to hear yourself, but it's allowing your yourself the time to go into yourself and talk to yourself. Literally talk to yourself and find yourself. Do it more and more. And you will start to discover who you are and you will allow yourself. And, and when, you, when you start to discover who you are, your system tells you, this is not the way I wanna go. Your system tells you, I'm done with this season of life. I think I'm ready for the next. Even when you don't know what the next is, your system is preparing you and saying, start learning new things. It's urging you on. But you've got to be willing to love yourself enough to give yourself the time and the trust to listen to yourself. It's such an exciting journey. Please, please start it and enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, I think uh, we can pick a comment from uh, Rotary and Sally, and then we we'll go for a final round of two, three questions, if that's okay with you, Julie. Thank you, uh, Rotary and Sally. Samantha, I've said you have a comment. Thank you, Ambrose. Julie, what a lovely evening. I love your comments and the, uh, the easy format that you're using. And uh, just to add on to what you've said in the last uh, response about discovering yourself, the thing I find is you have to trust yourself to let go. We, we, we reach somewhere and you know, I'm not comfortable, I'm not happy, and, um, but you still cling to what you have. So to get more, you have to open your hands, free what you're holding on to, and make that bold step. It's not easy, but once you've made that step, you realize that you can't stop, but you have to let go and you have to make that first step. Thank you. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. You can go on, you can go on, Julie. No, I was just completely agreeing with what Sally has said. It's wonderful, thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks so much. Let's have now a question from uh, Lois Masharia. You can please ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, my name is Lois Hanshaga and I'm glad to be here today. Okay, now um, in Kenya, we find that there are so many informal businesses, uh, some of which have mostly stemmed from a uh, lack of the lack of employment, the white collar jobs. Huh? Now, um, we see MasterCard Foundation uh, partnering with so many organizations to economically empower young people, especially with the Young Africa uh, Works Initiative. Yeah, and uh, now my question is your view from MasterCard Foundation and also as Julie, what is the future of informal businesses or how can we tune informal businesses or support informal businesses to go formal or to better themselves? Because mostly you find that most informal businesses people do lack information or lack the know how to uh, run their businesses and uh, are very fearful of going formal now what is your view towards the future of informal businesses and how to empower such businesses thank you 
Thank you. Thank you for that. I think first, let me say, um, informal holds the continent up. Informal needs more respect. Informal needs more regard. Informal needs communities surviving in the toughest of times, in the best of times. It is informal that run many of our economies. Even though we see the big players, we see those ones receiving the big tax awards, etc. There's got to first be the recognition, the respect for informal. Um, that really this is what holds the masses together. Um, so my thoughts are very simple. Um, how do we enable informal to thrive and to grow? And with a clear understanding that there is a suspicion, skepticism, cynicism around getting too formal and too, 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 too big uh, to the point that you have to formalize, then you end up in the tax bracket, right? So, so there are two different things at play here, but they're super interconnected. Um, for our, on our part as, as, as MasterCard Foundation, our challenge is to get 30 young 30 million young Africans into dignified work by 2030. Ultimately, the vast majority of that will come from small and micro-sized businesses. So it's upskilling, it's access to funding to, to get businesses started and get businesses moving and where businesses exist and are going through time, uh, hard times, get them through those difficult times. Um, it is capacity building, right? Um, I think we are really trying to think through this whole element, Lois, that you've introduced of what does it mean to be in the informal sector? How do we grow the capacity and grow informal in a way that it does not conflict need to go into formal or goes into formal comfortably and smoothly? Um, there are numerous questions there and we could probably have a whole session on that and maybe we should. Um, so I, I just recognize the complexity. We recognize the complexity of access to funding. Even now, as we are working very, very closely with you know, the equity group, with KCB uh, Foundation, in, in other players within other countries on the African continent, it remains a difficulty. People say it's still hard to get access to, to, to these. And so we as a foundation are looking towards going deeper and deeper and hopefully removing the intermediaries more and more. Who the individuals who are running the businesses and, and out in the fields, what we call the man in the arena. So Part of me being here is to speak to you guys as an African to, to, to young Africans in it, um, but also to say, you know, I'd love to hear, I think I put something there saying that, that she runs, a, I had seen something, you run a pop-up market, Ruth, I think, um, you know, Nicodemus has talked about what he's doing. Um, I, I'd love to know more and, and I'm quite happy for us to organize follow-up meetings into your experiences, the challenges. And, and by the way, before I close, my one question I want to ask you guys is if there's one thing we could do as a foundation that as for you, that, that for you would be super transformational from a business and um, stability perspective, keeps your business running, keeps your, your employees in jobs, you know, uh, to for more growth, um, even in these COVID times, if those that you needed, what would that thing be? Could you put it in the chat? I'm taking notes. So if you put it in the chat, I'm going to write the important for us to give us stuff. And I'm always happy to have follow up conversations. So Lois, I know I've only just scratched a little bit of your question. It is complex. And there's probably a lot of social work that needs to go around this economic approaches that need to be incorporated um, realities and, and local contexts uh, but we are here and as MasterCard, we are willing to do the work so yeah thank you thank you so much julie for the comment i think uh, the team that organized the meeting is not in and i'm sure we can uh, have another discussion around the informal uh, discussion so let's have a question from Winnie, Winnie Chepkemon. 
Hi, Julie and team. Nice. Uh, hi, hearing from you. Uh, this is really nice. And so my questions are two. So I really work within the international development space and I was based in and so um, my big question would be too, so what would you define success to you and does it change quicker and what is really, really the integral meaning of success to you or what should we envision success as young people? And then the second one is uh, based on the question of uh, informal economy. Uh, my biggest uh, question, <laughs> trouble with that is you really get people who really have, who tend to have sort of like a system within the informal sector and businesses that really have a over rate. And so the question then is, how do we transform the mindset of business owners within the informal sector that really have high turnover rate to think about transforming to a formal kind of business? And so what would be the push factor for them uh, to turn into a formal sector business? Thank you. Thanks so much. So starting with success. Success to me is fulfillment, but I don't think it's the same for everybody else. Um, it depends on who you're living for. I, um, when I feel fulfilled, um, fulfillment comes from feeling you've done something purposeful. Fulfillment comes from feeling you've impacted positively, you know, just in whatever way, small way, big way. And success to me is, is that. I think the worldly definition of success, being the things we can touch and see, is really, it's petty, seems very frivolous to me. I can't touch it, I don't understand it. It's very short term in my mind. Um, so awards are not success. In fact, I've always found, you know, when you're being celebrated, that's a really dangerous time because then you start drinking your own Kool-Aid and then maybe you don't work as hard because you think me fika, never fika, never, never. Every new day is a new day to do your best, right? So to me, success is when you end that day feeling that warmth in your spirit, you know, that's success. And, and, and you can do that at any stage of life. You don't need to get older like me to feel that, right? Um, on the question of what's the push factor for people to formalize, that's a really good question, to be quite honest. <laughs> I think I saw more taxes announced yesterday, some 1%, I didn't even understand. I was like, what, what, what? I didn't even understand. And, and to be really honest, all you are doing is, is really squeezing an economy that's suffering, number one, but dissuading those who are external, you know, uh, of the formal system, you know, to, to, to formalize. Why should they? Why would they? Why would they? And if the commensurate services are not being delivered uh, from the tax being, being paid, that makes it even more difficult. If it's harder to register your business and there's so many licenses and you're being harassed here and there, and, uh, and then it's, it's really difficult. And I think these are, these are conversations we need to have with policymakers as well. Uh, we need you know, varied stakeholders in rooms to come together and see what works best uh, with our different realities. And so I hope we can continue uh, that conversation. Sorry, Ambrose. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had, I had, I'm looking at so many questions. I'm wondering if someone can speak to them and then send them all yeah, to yeah. and go through them later. And also, if anybody is open to having a follow-up uh, conversation on the informal sector, micro and small businesses, and what is really needed, would you please um, also put your email here and Ambrose, if the team could get it to myself and Brenda, who, uh, Brenda is my assistant, but she's really my boss. She's here. Brenda, if you're here, say hi to everybody. <laughs> Thanks. 
Thank you, Julie. Yes, yeah, sure. We'll be able to get uh, the contacts for the guys who are interested in the informal uh, dis uh, economy discussion. And I think we'll also try to put a forum on that so that we can have that discussion on a broader perspective. You can pick two more questions if you don't mind, and then uh, we'll try to release you. I know you have another engagement somewhere. So there's a question from uh, Jason. Jason is asking, uh, what is that one thing? Okay, I, it's lost. What is that one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were young? Are there opportunities, challenges, and adventures you wish you took that you can challenge us to take? And then uh, I'm trying to look for another question that is in the chat box. Yes, I think we can uh, pick up that question from Jason. And then uh, for the rest of the attendees, please share in your questions. And also register on the form that we have. So that we'll be, we'll be able to forward all the questions to Julie for response to, to you guys for the questions that she'll not be able to cover today. So Julie, please. Wonderful, thank you. I see so many people interested in the informal economy uh, engagement conversation. That's great. Um, what's the one thing, you know, Jason, this is, this is, I, I'm so thankful that um, maybe as the only girl in my family, I had a lot of time with myself. I used to read a lot. I was such a chalk or swat in school. I always had a book here and I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with myself. So I got to know myself. And, um, and I talked to myself a lot. And during really difficult times, I kept, I kept saying to myself, just be idealistic. Everybody says, don't do this, don't do that. It'll never work. Don't listen. Just do what you believe you need to do. This is your vision for your life. Get the education. Walk the journey. You know, I took several jobs to get through university. Worked really, really hard. And it's interesting, Jason, because whenever people say, what would you say to your younger self or what that, you know, what is it that the young Julie didn't know? The only thing I can say to her is thank you so much. Thank you for believing in, 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 in me. Thank you for holding on. Thank you for not listening to all those people who kept saying can't, can't, can't. Don't, don't, don't. Shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't. Don't listen. Thank you, Julie, for just having the courage to to be stupid, because a lot of people did say, you're so silly, you're so idealistic, you're so naive, and I'm okay with that. And it got me where I am today, and thank you for that. So that belief in yourself, if you need to do something today, it is hold on to yourself, believe in yourself, trust in yourself. You're on the journey now of getting to know yourself, so know yourself really well. And, and um, and never lose hope and don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen. I always remember before Obama, when he was a senator and he came to Kenya and I, and I interviewed him that first time and I went back to the office and I was like, oh my gosh, it was such a great interview. This is what he's like. And I was like, and you know, people are saying he could become the president of America. And I remember my editor burst into laughter and said, a black man will never become president of America. That's what, that's what an African said. I mean, that's how, you know, we're such naysayers. Everything is on the table. You decide the life you want to live. So as a young person, if you are young on this call, keep telling yourself that every day, no matter how hard it gets. Even when I was eating packets of noodles, because that's all I could afford in uni was just noodles every single day, noodles, noodles. If I was lucky, I, I got some hot dogs, really cheap hot dogs, then I would chop the hot dog and put it in my noodles. And there was hot dog with noodles, <laughs> whatever. It didn't matter. I was going to get through it. I was going to try my best. So I'm thankful that I held on, I think, uh, if that makes any, any sense. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Julie. I think we can uh, finish up with, by picking a comment from Ruth. Ruth from uh, Zita Senka. And then we'll have uh, the vote of thanks from Frederick Oburu. Yes, Ruth, please. Ruth from Asenka. Uh, hi, everyone. 
Um, I, I was just uh, commenting, uh, answering, responding to the question that uh, Julie, you had asked earlier regarding uh, like small businesses and what difference it would make, uh, like how you would be able to contribute to make a difference. There are so many things. Um, I like what someone said, mentorship. I call it um, guided guidance, where like all of this, there's so many brands out here and some of them are really, really good, even the quality of the product and everything. But some of them just need either a little training is it um, like um, education in terms of how to package their, their product so that it actually represents the quality so that um, they're able to reach more people? Uh, it could also be, um, you know, training on like what you were saying earlier on taxation and how to formalize your business. Because some of these businesses actually have systems in place, but they're so afraid of being known because of just the fear of KRA. And we have been trying to make sure we we do a couple of trainings on the same so that people can stop running away from the formalization. So I think there's a lot um, that um, MasterCard actually has the ability to make available to some of the small business in terms of even the people that are already in your network that would make their process so much easier. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think this is a great conversation to, for us to follow up on. I, you know, I did see your comment on communications as well. And, and I think there's much more we, we can talk about. I'm happy to make the time um, later this month and maybe early December for a couple of conversations. Um, I, let me also just clarify. So just FYI, we're MasterCard Foundation. This is an incredible story. In 2006, MasterCard, the card company, um, you know, was going for an IPO and they decided to gift the world with a foundation. So they took 10% of their shares and put it in the foundation, uh, created this new foundation, independent uh, board, uh, president and CEO with an independent mandate. Um, and, and the shares have grown exponentially in value. We are uh, one of the three largest foundations in the world today, but we are not controlled by MasterCard because they gifted us to the world. I think this is a story of an incredible corporate um, corporate move of responsibility and kindness to say we're not going to control what they do or how they do it. So, um, so we are here really to just um, really to build uh, capacity. Uh, Young Africa Works is what we focus on. Two years ago, we decided the one thing we wanted to do was focus on helping young Africans actualize, find themselves, find opportunity and find dignified work. And we did this because the African youth population, the population is growing so fast. If the world doesn't address this as a serious problem, it is a global issue. The only other thing we do in the world is in Canada where we are registered and we have a program with indigenous Canadian communities who are highly marginalized. Um, and we work with them on education and, and capacity building. There's no other work we do in the world aside from in Africa with a focus on young Africans. So here to serve and really want to learn more. Looking forward to engaging again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion. And I think before I bring on Frederick to share his photo of of thanks, I think uh, it's very clear that uh, we need a follow-up discussion on the informal sector and the informal economy. And uh, I think the team will get in touch with your team and to see which date fits for to have the discussion and to just have a follow-up on the same. So thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Frederick. Um, thank you, Ambrose. Um, what a wonderful way of spending a Saturday evening. Julie, it was uh, very, very informative. It was a very informative meeting. You've had a lot to learn from a personal point of view. I've learned a lot ranging from family, business, leadership, mentorship, and all these values that uh, make us who we are as persons and as groups of, of people with uh, shared interests. A lot have uh, come up from this discussion. Ruth, thank you for coming out and for sharing what we can discuss. I think this is a very good time for this to come up. The club is uh, in, uh, almost closing up on a mentorship uh, program, career coaching, 
program that we need to run beginning uh, early next month or early January. And we'll definitely get in touch and have more discussions around this. Uh, they say that what is worth doing is this day because so I believe it would be good to appreciate the teams, the respective teams that uh, uh, played a role from uh, uh, pre the preparation uh, processes, posters, marketing, the consistent communication that we've had from uh, Julie's team, the Rotary Club of Nairobi, and the representatives from Youth Service, the Rotary Club of Nairobi Central, the Rotary Club of USIU, Africa, the Rotary Club of KCA University Information, and everyone who have spared their afternoon, or their evening rather, to be here. We are grateful and we look forward to a continued discussion on the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, I think now if the meeting is open for comments uh, and additions on the discussion for the day. And uh, thanks so much, Julie, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to having another awesome discussion uh, with you and with your team and to, the, the, to also see how far we can work together and also how can we together as a family push the discussion around the young people on the African continent. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So the so floor much. is open for any. Thank you. The floor is open for comments from anyone who has a comment. Uh, I know those who are used to Rotary meetings are wondering why we are where the speaker had to speak uh, a little bit earlier because she has another engagement. And so don't worry when don't think that we're finishing up the meeting. Bye, Julie. Anyone with a comment? Yes, uh, first can just time. open your mic. Actually, I'll let yes. Ritesh. I think Winnie uh, raised her hand. Okay, we no. Well, uh, sorry, um, it was past. So sorry, it was my mistake. <laughs> sorry. So, you know, so I was just congratulating uh, you, Rotarian Rotaract uh, President Ambrose, and uh, actually to all three clubs, RCNC, Rotaract, uh, USIU, and KCA Information, for organizing this uh, very special talk. Thank you. Good evening. Um, happy to be part of it and look forward to meeting some of the KCA University Rotaractors soon. Thank you so much, uh, P.P. Eldon and uh, President Ritesh. Let's keep on uh, the comments. If you have a song that you've been practicing to sing, you can also go ahead and practice with us. Uh. Uh, um, Pre President Nicodemus, I also wanted to congratulate you. This is Margareta, Dr. Margareta Wagasheru. I just wanted to congratulate you and all your rotor actors from your various schools. I'm just so impressed with your enthusiasm for rotary, and your enthusiasm for learning and growing and um, just taking full advantage of all the opportunities that Rotary has to offer and really appreciating that this is a values-oriented organization. And it's based on wonderful values, values that all Kenyans really need to embody them. Values of selflessness, service above self, and really, being mindful of others. So I really am thankful to you for um, supporting all of these young people and for um, being a rotor actor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Otelian Margareta. Uh, thank you for your 
uh, wonderful and uh, nice comments. I think uh, we are learning from you. And also, we also really appreciate the support that we are getting from you as our mother club. Uh, I'm sure uh, our tractor Samuel Karanja has a comment. So you can go ahead and also answer a question from uh, Rotarian Eva, which is touching on uh, when are you planning to transition to the Rotary Club of Nairobi? Okay. Okay. 